I'm going to talk to you about how you can grow an experimentation culture at your company. Hi everyone, my name is Ben Dressler. Um, a little bit of background about me. I'm uh, originally a psychologist and I spent most of my career at Spotify um, being a user researcher there at first and then building up the first experimentation team. I want to go about this in four steps. So I want to talk a little bit about the basics of what an experiment actually is, then about the pros and cons of running experimentation, about the culture, what that is and how you ramp that up, how it should look. And lastly, the different steps and traps, so the pitfalls you should avoid um, and what you can do to speed the process up. Okay, let's start with the basics. What is an experiment? I like this quote, which is, an experiment is a means of gathering information to compare an idea against reality by Colin McFarland, who is currently the experimentation platform director at Netflix. To give you an example, whenever ice cream sales rise, we observe more shark attacks. What our mind usually does when it reads statements like this is it goes to the start of this and connects it to, this, um, to the second part. So whenever ice cream sales rise, we observe more shark attacks. Does this mean that ice cream sales drive shark attacks? This example is obviously nonsense, so it's very easy to see through it. And it goes to show that correlation isn't causation, right? So that if two numbers or two quantities rise or fall together, that doesn't necessarily mean that one is driving the other. So in this case, obviously ice cream sales do not cause shark attacks. Neither do shark attacks cause ice cream sales to rise. What's probably the uh, commonality here is that there's another variable that we can't see in the statement, which is the external temperatures. When it gets warm in summer, people tend to buy more ice cream and also go and seek out the water, which may relate to more shark attacks. And again, this is an, a silly example and it's very easy to see through. But if you think more about something like this, that's something we all, I think, can relate to a bit better. When our users do engage things, we observe better outcomes. This is something that I've seen many times in my own experience. And I've seen smart people do this mistake. I've made it myself. So how this usually goes is that you observe your users. You might do some analysis, some segmentation. And then you suddenly see things like, hey, we get a bunch of users who might use more of our features or they spend more time in our app. And they also turned out to convert better, buy more, stay with us longer. And again, our brain does this thing where it instantly thinks that second thing must be caused by the first thing. So because these people, you know, they find our best features and they suddenly see the light, so they will be happier and longer uh, term customers. However, Again, it's easy to forget that it might be the other way around. Simply because these customers have retained longer with our product, they might have had more time to do all these things. Or, and that is in my experience the most likely factor, there's an invisible latent variable here that we can't see in our data. So to give you one example from my past, if you are a technology user and you're really into music, that's going to both make you very likely to retain on Spotify for a long time, but it also is going to make you very likely to use all of its hardcore features, right? Um, but if you're on that product team, it's just very tempting to think, ha, huh, someone is using our features, so they retain better, so we need to make everybody see those features. And that can be a very costly mistake. So how do we get from correlation to causation? Um, that is actually something we can just steal from science. And there are three main ingredients for causality. We need to change the status quo. We need to control for statistical noise. And then we need to observe what we actually have predicted. And I'll go a bit more into detail on these. So changing the status quo. Here you see a famous example of James Lind, um, who, as history or legend has it, uh, was the performing the first clinical trial in um, curing scurvy, actually. So what he did is, he was on the ship and some of his uh, sailors got sick with scurvy and um, he of a scientific mind paired the sick sailors into several groups, I think it was two at a time, and gave them different dietary supplements. So some would get certain types of food that the others wouldn't get. And as it turned out, the two sailors who got citrus fruit um, recovered. That is a very nice example of 
how making a very specific change to how things are going tells you something or can tell you something about what the effect of these things of this change can be. Now, of course, we all don't get so lucky in having this complete effect every time we do something, especially in, in the technology industry, in the product industry. I've, took, I've taken this example, this metric here, this line from a real world example. And if you think about the change I've noted there, this was a product change. Can you tell from how this curve goes whether or not we're having an effect here? Because if you look at first glance, you might think, yeah, that curve has gone up right around where this change happened. So it probably has an impact. But if you look closely, you see that the arrow is actually slide behind where that curve starts to rise. So maybe it's not caused by this. This is a fake example. So we didn't actually do a change here. This was simply a weekly user pattern and then um, the change by the season. So completely unaffected by anything we did back then. But I think it illustrates very nicely that humans and generally in, in tech, we deal with humans and metrics caused and uh, driven by humans. Humans make for very noisy um, subjects to observe because they do all kinds of things all the time because of reasons that are hard to discern from, um, from a distance. It might be the weather, it might be Christmas, something seasonal, it might be something that another team has done. Um, it's very hard to, to discern that. So unless you're causing changes that are absolutely dramatic, like maybe launching in a new market, uh, it's really important to be able to see through that noise. And how do we do that? Again, science to the rescue, um, and especially the, the field of medicine and, um, and psychology, because what people have been doing there for a long time is they control for that statistical noise by randomizing. And what that simply means and I've taken the Stanford prison example here because of its popularity, is that you don't say, oh, these people look very dangerous. So in our experiment where we put people into prisoner or warden roles, we'll make those dangerous looking people the wardens and the inferior looking people the prisoners. No, we roll a dice. And whatever the dice says, some people will go to become prisoners, some people will go to become wardens. And the key thing with randomization is if you do that at scale and enough scale, it will mean that all these inherent differences, um, genetics, gender, um, maybe your predisposition to certain uh, beliefs, attitudes, backgrounds, all of that should even out. However, what will not even out is the change that you're applying to one of these groups. So that means if you apply a change to one group that is in all other respects equal as the other group, then you can be fairly sure that any effect you're observing is due to what you've done. And lastly, and this is an important point, especially in our industry, we need to be able to observe what we have predicted would happen. The image here shows Peter Higgs, um, who famously predicted the existence of the Higgs boson particle. And it took 60 years and the most sophisticated machine ever built by humankind to prove the existence of that um, particle. And if you think about the tech industry, that is actually something that relates really well, because very often you might think about things you want to measure and you want to experiment on. So for example, you might want to increase customer satisfaction or customer lifetime value or long-term retention. And these are all things that are pretty hard to observe actually. That might be due to cookies expiring, that might be due to um, people changing their device, that might be due to something like customer satisfaction being actually fairly hard to um, measure by behavior. But it's a very important point to keep in mind. And here you can see how this all fits together. At the top, you have a population sample. That is usually the, the users that come into your experiment. We then apply some randomness, a coin flip, a hash, a, a roll of the dice, which determines whether people will go and be in group A or group B or group C, D, E, depending on how many groups you want. Whereas one group is normally the control group, which means we don't do anything. And the other group we call the experiment group or the variation or the treatment. And what happens here is that give these people the exact same experience than group A, but addition to that, we give them a change. 
and that is what we're going to try to find out about. We will then observe both these groups, and in our industry that usually means measuring a metric, um, conversion for example. When we have those two conversion or metric measurements, we will then compute the statistical difference between the two. So we will not just look, does one look larger than the other, but we will run a statistical test. And at the end, if there's a difference, and we say this is a difference we believe really happened, we can speak of an observed effect, and then we can conclude that the change we implemented had this causal effect that we observed. And that is really important. So how does this look in practice? This is a famous example from Google. It um, goes a couple of years back. And what they did is they ran um, an experiment on the color of hyperlinks. It's called the 50 Shades of Blue test, and it's gotten quite some um, fame in the experimentation community because it's been heralded as a great test by many people who care about conversion optimization and were amazed by the amount of testing and sophistication that went into tiny details like the shade of the color of a link. But there have also been um, a lot of people who have raised this as a big red flag because they've said, if we end up optimizing and testing every tiny detail of our page of our app, where does the human element stay? Where's the creativity staying? It has also caused a big backlash amongst especially the design community and many parts of the product community because people have started to feel that over-optimizing something takes away important other steps of the product culture. So for example, making longer term bets or acting on beliefs. So this is something that is, I think, well worth revisiting in terms of the pros and cons.